So next up, uh, we have Graham Linehan and Helen Lewis, who will be examining themes of modern dystopia and considering to what extent life is imitating through the visions of 20th century uh, science fiction and futuristic writers. Graham is a television writer, actor, and director who's made a number of uh, television comedies, most notable uh, Father Ted, Black Books, and for the people here, The IT Crowd, uh, in which a few of you may have from time to time noticed the odd org poster. Uh, so he co-wrote the first series of Brig Train and uh, created the 2009 We Love the NHS Twitter hashtag campaign in response to US Republican attacks on the NHS in the UK. Helen Lewis, who is joining him, uh, is deputy editor of the New Statesman, has written for the New York Times, Sunday Times and Guardian, among others. She's a regular host of BBC's Week in Westminster and a regular panellist on the Sunday politics. Um, I want to start, I promise this won't be self-indulgently about Twitter, but I think this is an interesting way to, to start, Graham. Stuart Lee wants to start it as the... Sorry, turned off my phone, uh, I'm yeah. so sorry. As uh, the Stasi service that people sign up to themselves. <laughs> yeah. But that wasn't why you left in the end, was it? Why did you leave? Uh, well, I, I thought that the... I thought that a lot of my problems with the site kind of came together... <clears throat> um, in one tweet, which was Donald Trump's North Korea tweet. Um, he's literally threatening violence against someone, a group of people, genocide in fact, uh, a group of people to, who he, he has ostensibly the power to commit violence to. Um, and Twitter's response to that was, it's newsworthy. So if they don't uphold their terms of service for people like him, then their terms of service are, are, are random and ridiculous. And so I thought that if they start applying it consistently, consistently to people like him, it'll trickle down into the people like Mike Cernovich, you know, uh, who spread Pizzagate, and, uh, you know, who regularly smears people as pedophiles. Um, uh, you know. So Pizzagate, for anybody who's lucky enough not to know what Pizzagate is, <laughs> it's this conspiracy theory that a pizzeria in Washington, D.C. was running a sex, child sex ring from its basement. Yes. It somehow linked to Hillary Clinton, because everything is on the internet. Um, and and what, right. the result of that in the end was that somebody turned up with a gun, I think. Someone turned up with an automatic rifle in, yeah. in the restaurant uh, uh, to check the place out. <laughs> so he looked around the ovens and then realized there were no secret tunnels. Uh, leading to a kind of sex dungeon, um, and then said, no, nope, checks out, and, uh, and, and left. And these people are, 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 being, um, are being kind of revved up by people like Cernovich, uh, you know, all the alt-right thought leaders, you know, who are all people who we, sh we should not know their names. <laughs> we shouldn't know any of their names. They're the dumbest, most ignorant people. And the thing that fascinates me is, is, is the monetizing of attention. You know, that's the, the thing that I think is most, um, uh, you know, free speech. I've, 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 always, been, I've always been incredibly anti-censorship and, 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 um, and so on. But I'm beginning to think, and I hate putting the word but in that sentence, but I'm beginning to think that the free speech <coughs> of these people who have monetized um, uh, their activities is uh, limiting the free speech of other people. So I thought that maybe this is a way of doing it. But I checked after I left Twitter and the market share price didn't go down. <laughs> <coughs> so I don't think it's had a huge effect. But, um, but the other reason was just personal. I just felt that I needed to um, uh, uh, stop the constant influx of bad news. It was becoming influx, is that a word? Mm. Uh, but I, I, I needed to, to limit that because I was beginning to, I think it was beginning to get me uh, depressed. I, I mean, I definitely feel that. And, and you know, my job is specifically news-based and politics news-based. But I've had exactly the same problem, and it does feel particularly since Donald Trump came into power. And, and, and all the stuff that he's done in terms of destabilizing the kind of norms of democracy, right? The idea that those are all just being eroded, that he can just say crazy things with all the authority of a president endorse conspiracy theories, point people in the direction of, of wild people like Alex Jones of Infowars. 
and actually, the kind of paradox of the internet was it was supposed, you know, it was going to offer us all this access to information. And it turns out, as you say, when that's when information is no longer scarce, what becomes scarce is attention. And actually, everybody's constantly trying to leap on you for that yeah. to grab your attention. I don't know if you remember, but there was a there was a, a, a play, a Shakespeare play in the states where they killed a, a Julius Caesar, where they killed a, a Trump type figure, you know. And I think. Someone will help me here, but it was Laura Southern who, who stood up and, and, and uh, started shouting during it and protesting. She opened a Patreon account that day. That morning, she opened a Patreon account. Then she stood up during the play, brought the production to a standstill, uh, got arrested, £20,000. You know, 20,000 within, you know, a couple of hours. But that is the paradox of social media, where, where that social media plays out in these things, right? So you looked at the Charlottesville rally of white supremacists, and actually it was about a couple of thousand people with strange torches and, you know, um, looked like their mums and I did love all that. That was so, I mean, apart from, obviously, it was terrible what happened, excuse me. But, <laughs> but I loved that these guys suddenly, there was one of my favourite videos is a guy who had the white shirt and the red hat, and he... You can see him running uh, at full speed, and he just takes off the hat and takes off his shirt and says, I was joking, I was joking, <laughs> like this. It's fucking brilliant. That happened over and over again with different people. I was so happy to see all these people lose their jobs. And, but but uh, there, there is another side of it that I find very sad, because I think, that, I think that a lot of these guys are teenagers who think they're doing something funny. And, like... You know, there's two. There, there's a guy I follow. I think his uh, username is Honored Spirit on Twitter, and he he points out some of these things as well. And and he, um, you know, he constantly points out all these guys. Those two guys recently who got arrested for uh, for um, attempted murder. They're going to get ten years in prison because of memes. You know, and it's like, is it worth it? Is it really worth it? All these guys think think it's, there's just something kind of funny or, or transgressive about it, and they're. They're just ruining their lives. And I think that people like Baked, Alaska, and Cernovich, and stuff, they're... they're but what's really frightening, excuse me, to, to extend, extend that up, upwards is, I don't know if you know, but today uh, there was a joke going around Twitter that today was going to be the Antifa uprising. Did anyone see this? Yeah. So today someone wrote a tweet that said something like, can't wait for whatever date this is when uh, the Antifa will rise up and behead parents in the, town, in the town squares all over America, okay? So obvious joke, you know? Fox News reported it as fact last night, <laughs> you know? So Fox News is joining in with this and, and they, they, they know that this is, they know what it is. So they're, they're trying to kill people. They're trying to make people kill other people. It's really frightening. Yeah. And, it's, and again, it's why I had to get off Twitter. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think for, for health reasons, it's, it's definitely, <laughs> for blood pressure reasons, it's good. But I think one of the things that we don't, it, it's quite hard to talk about when we talk about social media is how that exists in an ecosystem with traditional media. And your Fox News point is exactly right. Over the last uh, you know, 20 years in America, you've essentially seen a kind of creation of an alternative media, right? And through Rush Limbaugh and talk radio, through to Fox News, through to individual stations, and now YouTubers like Paul Watson, uh, Peter, what's his name? Yeah, his Paul Watson, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, and a sign of a silo of people who actually don't have access to information. All their information diet comes from these people who have these incredibly extreme views. Mm. And that's a strange free speech issue in itself, actually, about how does the kind of mainstream of opinion penetrate into those silos. Mm. Is, there, is there any solution to that? Uh, I, just, I just think we've got to stop treating it like it's normal. You cannot treat people like this like they're normal. You cannot say there's a debate about whether to punch Nazis. You, you punch Nazis. <laughs> when, you see, when you see a Nazi, you, you, you have to defend yourself because their very existence is about eradicating the existence of most, most other people on the planet. Right? So, but what if Nazis think treating... that you should be punched? This is the problem. And once you concede that punching is a legitimate, in a democracy, is a legitimate political expression. Oh, well, I didn't want to steer into the, into the, punching, into the, <laughs> into the punching debate. Sorry. But, but all I can say is they're Nazis. Their opinion doesn't matter. Okay. You've got a zero tolerance policy on Nazis. Yeah. And I think that's probably they, a very popular position. They had, a, they had position. an argument about, eradic about killing every Jew on the planet, right? That argument has been debunked, I think, quite uh, rigorously. I think we we need to remind them of that at every stage. You know, it's 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 just loathsome to me that that there's even any debate about this. You know. So the next question has to be: What responsibility? Oh God, this is like being on Twitter. 
<laughs> it isn't because people haven't started shouting extraneous, <laughs> random, unhelpful yes. comments from the audience yeah. yet. Give it time. Um, but the next question then has to be what kind of responsibility to the platforms themselves have. So I'm sure you've seen this news that's come out about the fact that a very popular tweeter who started off being somebody in 2014 who was having opinions about Kim Kardashian suddenly, last year, suddenly started having very strong opinions about Hillary Clinton and about peddling, peddling conspiracy theories and has been revealed to be a Russian troll. Right, yes. So there is an entire possible that Mike Cernovich might be actually an amazing Russian spy rather than a weird, weird guy. Oh, but you... <laughs> I don't think Mike Cernovich is an intelligent guy. I think he's... he's... That's, how, that's how intelligent a spy yeah, he is, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. He's, but... That's an incredible impression of a complete idiot. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what, is, what is Twitter's responsibility in terms of checking... Enforce their TOS. It's yeah? that simple. Just enforce them. Just, 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 just be transparent about them. Just when, when people break them, fucking punish them. Trump at least should have had a suspension for threatening to kill a nation of people. <laughs> you know? Okay, when you put it like that, it does sound quite a reasonable thing to do. It's not, it's not like, it's, they, they have a, a business, a service, it's a, it's, a, it's a piece of technology. It's not like, you're, you're not suggesting that Twitter goes around and punches each Nazi that comes on the thing. They're just saying, this is your space, you've created this space, you have to at some point provide some kind of um, stewardship, you know, some kind of leadership and, and moral thinking. The, the guy who, who um, the, uh, one of the guys from the TV show Silicon Valley, he said recently that one of the most frightening things for him in all the research they do is they've spoken to all these guys who come up with some piece of technology. I don't know, this one, this one randomly kills babies. Or let's take that as an extreme example. This one randomly kills babies. Every 10 baby uh, dies. It's amazing. We've, we've developed it and it, it actually works. You know? And they go, OK, but you're not going to do this. So you're not going to actually release this. And I go, huh? <laughs> they don't understand that, be, that there might be a reason not to release some of this stuff or not to kind of, uh, or, to, or to, just, to just, you know, uh, extend some uh, Just because you can do something, not necessarily well, mean exactly. that you should it's, do it's something. Well, exactly, that old argument. But that know? is a huge argument in um, AI research because AI is already getting to the stage where, you know, it can tell people's faces in credit, you know, facial recognition in crowds. They put AI on the internet, it turns racist within a couple of minutes. <laughs> there was... That chat bot that unfortunately people from 4chan got hold yeah. of. Um, yes, yeah. that was an issue. But there is exactly that question about the kind of... And, and you get more sensible AI researchers who will say things like, actually, I don't think we should build humanoid robots. That's just a thing that we shouldn't do because it is bad to start relating to people in that interpersonal way. I'm only in favour of humanoid robots if they kill us, kill us all. <laughs> <laughs> um, seems legitimate. That is a joke. That is. OK, but... <laughs> I think verified Twitter accounts should be spared. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. It's, it is another thing about that. It's the fucking verified thing. They only care about verified. Apparently, Jack only listens to verified accounts. You know, it's like he he shits himself every time you know uh, a verified account gets in touch with him. And he answers them. No one else doesn't care about anyone else. But the, that does work in the other direction too, which is that some of you we're familiar with the career of internet provocateur Milo Yiannopoulos, and he actually asked a question at a White House briefing when his blue tick was taken away. That's how. <laughs> Know, he yeah. was. That was funny. Yes. Julian Assange is so upset about not having a blue tick, he's got a blue diamond that he's That's given right. himself. I love that. Which I is love also extreme. So there is, it has got great trolling potential I'm in the positive I'm so happy sense. I didn't go all in on Julian Assange. Because I quite liked, I quite liked, you know, when they released the, the, the Iraq video and I thought, oh, WikiLeaks, you know, and stuff like that. But I was always a little bit nervous about him and I'm so happy I was because, my God, what an asshole he's turned out. <laughs> <laughs> I think we are allowed to say WikiLeaks an good, Julian Assange bad. Fucking creepy, rapist weirdo. And and for a second we were all like, oh maybe maybe he's going to lead us into this new promised land of of information. It's like, oh my god, what an asshole. That, that is one good thing about Twitter. It does reveal assholes, you know, which I'm sure people think about me, but. Like. It's too late. You're not there anymore. <laughs> yeah. But okay, so let's dwell on the asshole thing. I wish I hadn't said that. But um, 
I that's think there is, a, there is an issue, and it kind of speaks to what the thing you were saying before about people not ever having thoughts about um, you know, what their technology can be done with. I do think there is a, a significant problem that there is such a thing as kind of what we, what we call a Silicon Valley ideology that a lot of this tech comes out of, which is a very libertarian ethos about you know, just... You yeah, know, I realise that too late as well. I'm really annoyed at myself. Well, we'll, yeah, we'll, come, we'll come back to techno utopianism and its discontents later, but also about the fact that it is also a predominantly middle-class... Uh, white and Asian men. Actually, if you look at the, the, the statistics from everybody who works at Facebook, Google, Twitter, you know, the big, big tech giants, they are a pretty homogenous group of people. And how much do you think that has affected the products that they've built? Well, you know, the, the signs are all around us. You know, some of, the pe- some, some of the people who seem to be involved in that seem to be deeply odd. My favourite example is Peter Thiel. Mm. Uh, you know, he, 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 uh, he's PayPal, right? Uh, yeah, and then he's an angel, he was an early angel investor in Facebook. Yeah, and he's the guy who, who financed the Hulk Hogan legal battle, which brought down Gawker. Which and he wants to build an island in the sea so that he can get around labour laws. And he wants to live forever by, and I'm not making this up, uh, using the blood of younger people. Did you hear about this? <laughs> the, if you saw Silicon Valley, the Blood Boy episode is based on Peter Thiel. And he also you thinks know? women shouldn't vote. Does he? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's really big. He's got the, <laughs> he's got the full house. Yeah, um, yeah. He, now Mark Zuckerberg is running for fucking president, you know. These are deeply odd people, you know, and, they, and, and I originally thought, because, I guess, because of the echo chamber of various different reasons, I just thought, oh, they're just, they're just like me. They're just, they're just kind of liberal, friendly people who want to live and let live, and they want to do good things with their tech and all this sort of stuff. And it turns out very, very seldom seems to be true. I think, I, think, I don't know what it is, but maybe the, the genius that it takes to create some of these platforms, maybe that, maybe that sucks something from their em- 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 empathetic side, you know? I don't know. I also think there's a kind of boy emperor syndrome as well, in which somebody who has a good idea is then protected and coddled and cosseted and turned yeah. into a kind of somebody that, you know, that it, and, and it's all seen as being their achievement entirely. You, know, fa- you can't build Facebook on your own. Yes, Mark Zuckerberg had a great and monetizable idea, but it took a lot of other people to build that. Mm. And that's a kind of, you know, that comes back to that Elizabeth Warren idea about paying tax. You know, we, you're taking your goods to market on a road that we all built. Mm. And there's no acknowledgement in lots of those Silicon Valley Firms, I don't think that they are relying on a civil contract and a social contract that has been built up. They just think that they're amazing and they make loads of money mm. and therefore they should well, kind of be allowed to do what they want. Twitter's, Twitter's thing, Twitter is so uh, fixated on, on making money that I just think it's really corrupted them. It's, it's turned it into a bit of a toilet now, you know, and, and I think if something could be done about that, if something could be done about, about taking Twitter's mind off that, then... You might have a platform where, you know, where th- that problem I was talking about, where people feel that they're being silenced because of the ferocity of some of the voices on there, is less of a problem, you know? It, it, it becomes more of a, a room like this, you know? This looks like a nice place to have a debate and have a chat, you know? Uh, um, it, it, you need, uh, Twitter could just needs to be a space like that. And at the moment, it's not. It's, it's, it's awful. <laughs> it's but there are, I mean, there are lots of things that you, you know, and actually they've now finally got to the stage of saying, well, maybe we just won't show any tweets from people who don't put their phone number in or, don't, or use the default profile. And those are things that you can block out yourself. I was talking to somebody who researches um, ISIS propaganda, and she said, well, actually, one of the things that would be really helpful is if somebody signs up for 10 accounts that all got very similar names, on the 10th one, it triggers you, and you have to put a credit card in and pay, you know, a penny, right? Mm. And that, obviously, anybody wants, but there's always a question, you say you won't have whistleblowers or whatever, so you need to have anonymous access to accounts, that's fine, but to one account, right? Mm. Not to 20 that you sign up for in the morning. Sure. So, but, but they just, you know, that's something that is, is you know, would just be hassle and prevent that kind of idea of growth. Yeah, it'd be nice if there was a little bit of hassle to doing some of this stuff, you know? Some of this, if you're, if you're, uh, harassment can kind of be automated almost, you know? And, and if that was just a little bit more difficult, then, I don't know, maybe, maybe things would be better. Well, let's go back to um, Mark. God, I'm so glad there's another question so I didn't end on that. <laughs> Think maybe things could be better. Maybe they could, maybe they won't be. <laughs> um, let's go back to Mark Zuckerberg running for president because there's amazing studies on this. So Facebook itself did research that said if they put a, you know, I voted sticker on your news feed that people could click on, that actually drove up, I think, turnout by 0.5 percentage points. Certainly an incredibly statistically significant amount uh, when taken across a whole population. There is also evidence that they can manipulate your emotions through the news feed by giving you happy or sad stories, for example. Um, one of the things that came out in the course of the Russia investigation is that you know the ads are, hu- are so highly targeted, and this is something that 
you know, talk about things that you got wrong, something that I got wrong. I didn't think it was a bad thing that Facebook was able to sell ads based on, for example, assuming that you were gay based around the fact that you like, I don't know, the L word, queer as folk, Judy Garland, whatever it turns out to be, right? I thought that was a kind of, that was a, a, a neutral piece of information because your friends might be able to guess that too. Um, but as it turns out, what it means is that, for example, the targeting of political adverts, you can be, you, they won't let you explicitly target by race, but there are lots of things that you can use as a proxy for income and race. So you can do quite effective voter suppression through mm. Facebook, which is a huge electoral issue. So that in itself is already a big problem. Put that into the hands of somebody who is, as you say, all the signs are that Mark Zuckerberg is either running for president or maybe running to be god emperor of the world. Maybe that his ambitions are, are bigger just, than that. Maybe he just likes visiting farms. <laughs> <laughs> I love the way that those cows looked back at him in a kind of in the non Just a way normal that, guy looking at a farm. Yeah. He's very interested in steel making in Ohio and always has yes, been. Yes, yes. Um, does that worry you? Uh, yeah, but my problem is a little bit that Facebook never clicked for me. I didn't really, uh, I don't really understand it. I don't really participate in it. It's, it's, that was a long lead up. I should possibly have jumped in earlier to tell you this, but, but I don't really, I don't really get Facebook. Uh, you know, f for me, Twitter just worked a lot better for, for, you know, how I, how I wanted to, uh, interact with people. So, you know, I never really got into it. So when, when I hear about all these bots and so on, I, I, I only have a kind of vague understanding of what, of what all that, you know, is when it comes to Facebook, you know? Well, that, that, then that is, raises an interesting question, because my interest in Twitch has definitely diminished, and my time I spend on it, I think, probably has diminished. And actually, Facebook, I sometimes, I, you know, I, I feel less and less enthused about. I, you know, these, thing, these, these, so com the these companies seem so huge, right? Yeah. But but actually, are, you know, if you look at the relative status of Microsoft in the 1990s and now, is this a transitory problem? Or is this, have we fundamentally changed the way we communicate in a way that has big effects on our rights? I, I, I don't know. I mean, I mean you know, I could, I could bluff an answer there, but I really don't know. I mean, I know, I know a few, there's, there's certain things that I think are, are very important. I think the first one is that uh, we need to start talking about getting into survival mode about climate change. Okay, I don't know about you, but it's too warm. It's, it's too warm too late in the year. That really frightens mm. me, and no one is talking about it. So I think the, uh, our responsibility to some extent is to move past some of the noisy um, antagonism and uh, uh, infighting that's going on and get onto really only that subject in a way. Because I think w if we're all dead, then other questions of rights don't really come into it, you know? So, yeah. so I, 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 I personally think that, yeah, I mean, my, my feeling of, of trying, to, trying to force a change in my, in my ridiculous, pathetic way in Twitter is, is, is kind of partially to do that. I want to move the conversation. I don't want to keep having the same conversation, so I, I remove myself from it. Uh, you know, I think it's the... I think, I think we need to be a little bit more proactive. I think we do need to stop waiting for people like uh, uh, Jack of Twitter to, to, to change. And, and, you know, before it all sounds total gloom and doom, I think Trump coming to power and Twitter, com the combination has actually led to some brilliant things. Uh, I know we, we, we may not disagree about this, but I think Me Too, uh, the Me Too hashtag feels like a, a huge sea change. I think... I think there's a chance the world might never be the same after it. But I don't know, possibly. I think one thing that social networks have done, have they have put a lot of problems in your face that if they, you know, interpersonal problems, that if you weren't personally exposed to them, you could get away with turning a blind eye to them. So yes. I would absolutely put something like Black Lives Matter into that. Yes, you know, and repeal the eighth has been... Uh, I don't think Ireland would have uh, even considered uh, um, what they're considering now. Uh, in, in uh, liberalising the abortion laws if it hadn't been for the repeal the eighth movement, you know, uh, and, and before that for the, the equal marriage movement. And I don't think they would have considered the equal marriage movement if it hadn't been for the internet. So there are some great things happening. Uh, 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 an odd thing that's happened with, with Trump is, is all these Confederate statues coming down. That's great, you know. And so in, in, in odd ways, the, 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 there, there, is, there has been a bit of a proactive fight back that I'm, I'm really um, happy about. 
My concern about Me Too is, is what comes next in terms of whether or not structures are put in place to pursue that, and also about the backlash. And this was something I maybe I'll, before we open up to questions, I will ask you. You've been a man for some time, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> therefore I presume you have great insights into this. And none of these internet I like movements. The hours. <laughs> You know, Gamergate, um, I think a lot of 4chan culture is very overtly, uh, not locker room, but the kind of geek version of a locker room. Um, you know, the, the guy who got fired from Google for his anti-diversity memo. You know, there is something about um, a feeling of masculinity under attack. I think you definitely see it in the far-right movements, about a, a reassertion of traditional values that is, apart from anything else, a reassertion of traditional gender values. Well... Possibly, but I also think that it's, it's partly... One of the things that I used to think was so wonderful about Twitter was that I thought it was like we had all suddenly become um, telekinetic. We'd, we, we'd all suddenly now were connected to each other and it was, um, uh, you know, plugging into a, a, a hive brain to some extent. But, but, but what happened, it seems to me, is that... Is that Four channers and, and and all these people, which I think is a adolescent male point of view, they plugged into it as well. And now this adolescent uh, misogyny that I think comes from immaturity, uh, fear of women, um, fear of emotions, fear of you know all sorts of things that you get past, you know, if you're a, if you're a young angry uh, boy. Um, uh, I, I think I think our consciousness has been tuned to that frequency a little bit and, and we just need to remind ourselves that it's not real. It's, it's, it's something that... The, 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 another reason why I hate people like Milo Yiannopoulos is Milo Yiannopoulos took all these young guys, very cynically, you know, the Gamergate thing, which he pumped after insulting gamers in many uh, tweets earlier on. But, but, but he, I know, I was like, bro, do you even have an Xbox One? Yeah, no. exactly, exactly. <laughs> but he said to these young guys, the way you feel now at 17 lonely unable to 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 meet a girl uh unable to think of anything to say to a woman the way you feel the anger you feel now that's really you that is really you and you must remember this feeling and you must join together with other people who feel this way and 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 fight back against these bitches Mm. that's what milo yiannopoulos is 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 arguing and Sorry, I get angry and I forget my point. But but <laughs> but but the thing is, I think I don't think that it's a it's a. I think that the real um, backlash is going to be against people like that because once we realise that this once and and I think all these kids they're going to get older and they're going to if if they haven't ruined their lives by appearing in a news uh, in a newspaper with a tiki torch mm. they're gonna they're gonna just look back at it and they're gonna. Die of embarrassment. But then that is, again, that brings us to another problem, which you know, the right to be forgotten stuff speaks to that as well, about actually on the internet, do your mistakes live on forever? And, and I think there is a, a big problem for that. Maybe that transitional generation, I think probably really young generation, really young teenagers are actually much more careful about what they put on the internet. I know, I really... They know that yeah. it will stay there forever. But there is a kind of horrible generation who probably will be caught out by the you know, ghosts th- of their past selves. Absolutely. I think that that's a real... A real Problem. I think there's going to be a lost generation of people who, who have various, who said stupid things on Twitter, who, who, who got photographed in the wrong place, who decided to be a Nazi for a year for a laugh. You know, yeah. and these people, their lives are going to be ruined. You know. Well, on that bleak note, uh, <laughs> does anyone have a, a question? Um, I'll, take, I'll take two from over there because you're sitting next to each other and therefore it makes you handy. We're getting microphones on, on the side there, um, in the grey shirt and then in the red shirt. And then can I get another mic to you with the orange wristband? Oh, actually, you've all got orange wristbands. That was <laughs> literally the worst possible thing I could have done. I thought it was a bracelet. It was not a bracelet. Uh, 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 okay. I mean, it, I mean, the what is it that is that is top here? Is life imitating art? My feeling and understanding of the West as I know it today, after living here for the last 37 years, it is not life, I mean art, is supposed to articulate life, and rather life, not to imitate it. In other words, the art you talk about and all these things, all the arts that you have, either in writing or in the films or whatever you're doing and all these things, is a violation of all norms known because of what you call liberalism, but you have turned it into libertine. Anything goes. That's what you do, okay. and that's what you do, and only things. Okay. Please comment. 
Thank you very much. Can I pass it two rows back to uh, you in the black top? Well, you had your hand up, didn't you? Yes. Yeah, go for it. Well, let's take three questions at a time, and then we can see if there's any overlap. I find it incredibly disingenuous to associate uh, the whole of the Oz media with the Nazis' ends of it. I think uh, I write for the Oz media, and I find that... Uh, Which outlet did you write for? Uh, for the word and Cisco, they're very small platforms, now it's a blog. But um, they're, uh, the, the real media that should be, uh, you know, shone a light on is I find the BBC and companies like that actually lied to us about the Iraq war and other things like that, which were actually much more severe things to lie about than, you know, a bunch of guys uh, walking around, uh, you know, uh, writing on 4chan with slightly misogynistic messages. I find that uh, to, to make this sweeping generalization that the, the alt media is fake news or that it's a uh, Someone I don't think anyone did that. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I mean, if that's what you heard, then I'm sorry, because I don't think that's what we were uh, I, I certainly don't feel that way. In your speech, there was this implication that, uh, because you gave the example of Mike Chernovich, which you obviously don't like, uh, uh, that somehow all of the alt media is like him, and all of the no, alt no, media, no. It, it, maybe we should make allowances for the censorship of alt media. And to be honest, I'm here uh, not to hear about how we should censor people, but how we should prevent the censorship of people. Because I, for one, have had enough of lies from the established me media, so I'm very looking forward to the establishment of an alternative media, which is not, uh, you know, uh, the, the guard dog of the Tory uh, uh, party or things like that. I want more of the alt media, and I think we are here to debate how not to have more censorship, but how to get rid of censorship, whereas you actually call for censorship. I didn't call for censorship. I called for, I called, I called for all media to uh, have the same standards of truth. It's that simple. If, 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 if uh, someone like Mike Cernovich is... Uh, putting people's lives at risk by uh, uh, pumping up a fake conspiracy about paedophiles, then he should be shut down. He should be shut down, yeah? You agree with that, right? You agree that people's lives shouldn't be put at risk because someone's lying. I think the BBC lied about several, and that's much more severe than my journey which is mentioning Pizzagate. That's whataboutism. It, it's not. It is. It is. It's whataboutism. Wow. Okay. I think I know where you stand now. Thank you very much. It used to be very popular to say if we just ignored these proponents of stupidism, they'll just go away. If we just didn't show Trump rallies on loop, then Hillary Clinton would have won middle America and it all would have sorted itself out. Mm. Is it no longer acceptable to just ignore these people, to just put Katie Hopkins in a corner and let her rant on and then, well, it's worse if we challenge her because then she gets more attention? See, I don't think you should challenge Katie Hopkins. I think you should challenge the people who enable Katie Hopkins. And that's the thing, from my perspective, and it speaks to the, um, the question we just had, actually. Weirdly, a lot of what you do as a journalist is not print things because you find out that they are not true, right? Or you make editorial judgments, and that's not necessarily censorship. I've got, a, you know, people send me some pretty hot stuff about what they think happened with the moon landings, and I decide not to share that with a wider audience. <laughs> Because, you know, you've got, I've made a, an editorial judgment on that. But the, the thing that, what reminds me about Katie Hopkins is exactly the same point with Miley Annopolis, is what are the platforms and people who pushed her and pushed him because they were useful for their agenda? So, actually, Milo uh, was just sacked from Bright, well, Robert Mer was sacked from Breitbart after some other remarks, uh, was, was taken off Twitter after his harassment of Leslie Jones. And actually, Robert Mercer, the billionaire who funded several pro-Trump things, has now kind of said, I just, I found out this guy's not very nice, and I'm very upset about that, and I'm cutting all links with him. And, and those are the people that you need to ask the questions of. Like, there will always be parasites, and I, and I, I don't mean to use such an offensive phrase, but that's what I see them as. They are, they are people who find, you know, they're all like, you might describe them as a machine learning algorithm, right? They seek out the, the vulnerability in a system and exploit it. But the question is, I think Katie Hopkins is just an attention seeker. I think if this was 1917 in Russia, she'd be a Bolshevik, right? She'd be incredibly left-wing. That would be the, the way that she would get herself some attention. But the question is, who employs Katie Hopkins and why do they do it? And those are the people that you put pressure on because they will always be attention seekers. But who are the people who are pushing them? And Twitter was allowing Milo on their service despite clear violations because they didn't want to have the fight because they thought he was interesting and a provocative voice. And so did Breitbart until it became too hot for them. And the same thing with LBC and the Mail Online. They want to put Katie Hopkins there because she drives attention and clicks. Well, at some point we have to say, does your business model is more important than poisoning our discourse? That was my rant, anyway. You had your rant earlier. That was my rant. Yeah, no, I love that. <laughs> Hello. Um, so the question on this debate about life imitating art, um, it feels like 
it's a pretty bleak situation at the moment. And there's seen a lot of things like Black Mirror and things that Charlie Brooker has written being very prescient. Can we get some more cheerful utopian future? <laughs> that, that... Do you think it's like Charlie Brooker I, I, controls reality and if he starts writing upbeat stuff, no, everything I, will be better? I, I, I do agree with that. I, I love Charlie's stuff, but, but, but um, I couldn't... I've, I made a decision about 10 years ago, I think, that I, w I was going to try and cheer people up uh, and try and keep some of the stuff I've been talking about today out of what I do. Because <clears throat> I think it's becoming uh, a bit more of a... Uh, <clears throat> you know, it's something I know I can do, so I might as well do it. Because, because, yeah, you, you, we need something, you know. It's, it's very dark at the moment. It's very dark at the moment, but hopefully not in my shows. Uh, Hello. Thank you very much for the talk and all the interesting, it's obviously caused some heated debate. Um, I guess another positive thing is, and because life imitating art, like the internet has allowed for creators <coughs> and new voices to come up and echoing this one woman's point and coming from the mainstream media, I think that's like absolutely brilliant. And the questions of like why did all these things happen and going back to the beginning kind of get lost uh, in blaming one another. I think felt it quite terrifying when we were talking about Charlottesville and then the link got brought to MEMS and things like that. Because I, I find we that... It got brought back to what, sir? To MEMS. Right, um, memes. Yeah, yeah, memes. Sorry, I always get that wrong. Yeah, no, sorry. <laughs> but because, because I think that, that these also get put into this category of propaganda when actually for like a young person, it can also be like this form of expression that's quite beautiful. And it comes from whatever side of the political coin. And so I think it's quite terrifying and much similar to like, you know, blaming any hip hop album for, or Marilyn Manson for kids shooting up Columbine. And I think we need to really ask the questions of, why this stuff is happening, rather than blaming it on platforms or... Okay, I'm going to rudely cut you off, because I know we've got lots of questions, so I'm going to blitz through, and then we can try and see how many we can um, tackle. Hello. Hi. Um, in Father Ted, you had... Uh, I don't know if you specifically wrote it, but there was an amazing joke. It was, um, I'm a priest, not a Nazi. Nazis go around <laughs> in black telling people what to do. <laughs> Whereas priests... And that was amazing. I know a lot of people who grew up in Ireland and who were, had their lives changed by, your, by art that you created. Oh, it's not just the internet that might be having an effect on things like Repeal the Eighth. It's also kind of the seeds that you sowed as an artist. Um, That's very kind of you, thank as you. As a creative person in the media. So if life is imitating art, what can or should artists be doing now to help make a better future? Well, I, I, think, I think one thing we're, we, I think one problem with art at the moment is uh, uh, the acceleration, accelerationism, is that a word? Mm. But the accelerationism that's going on, it is impossible to, how could you write, for instance, a comedy about Trump? Uh, how could you do it? It would be impossible. Nothing could beat Scaramucci's week in, 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 in power, you know? There's so many examples, and they keep coming, you know? Someone said on, 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 on Twitter, uh, oh, you're still talking about that thing this morning? That is to me in the mists of time. And it, it's, it's true. We, we were talking about, about Joe Brand um, uh, uh, kind of um, uh, taking... Uh, in his lot to task on have I got news for you I've seen it about three times now I was, I was, I was when did that happen that happened last night you know it's so weird it, 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 so, so, so there's a and, and, and I, I used to say that the person I felt most sorry for was Martin Amos because Martin Amos <laughs> used to be the zeitgeist writer yeah. can you imagine how much trouble he'd have writing about the modern world now no one can do it. The only, and it's why I often think of Twitter as a living novel. It's, it's the great American novel and everyone's writing it. You can see lines and uh, tweets that are as good as anything out of one of Martin Amos' novels. And only that, only Twitter, you know, at its best, when it's wonderful, which it often is, is capable of, of showing us, that, of, of reflecting what the world is now. I think that, you, you know, a bit of distance, a bit of calm, you know, maybe we'll be able to write about it. But at the moment, I think artists are just fighting to, to be heard and fighting to, to, 
produce anything, you know, and you just got to keep doing it. And, but I think and Father Ted is a really good example. So I grew up watching, my, my family are enormously Catholic, right? My dad is a deacon in the Catholic church. My mum was an RE teacher. That's how Catholic we were. <laughs> and my mum loves Father Ted and says, oh, of course, anyone who's not a Catholic wouldn't even understand it. Whereas I always saw it as very, you know, a program that was more in tune with my atheist sensibilities, the one that was very critical of established power. And actually, you know, there's a kind of tragedy at the heart of these people who are trapped together. But that's what art does, is that both of those things are true, right? It is both warm yeah. and it is also a tragedy. Like, there is, there is that element in it too. And that's what art can do that Twitter can't do, right? Is it can keep those, that dialectic together. It can keep those modes together. Yeah, I don't know. What's the, what's the quote? I can't remember it. But the, but the um, uh, ability to hold two conflicting thoughts in your head at the same time. A good story will actually be that. It, mm -hmm. it'll, it will argue one uh, side of the coin and then argue the exact opposite. And at the end, you'll have a feeling that you could not get from any, anything else, from a newspaper article or whatever it is. You just got to try and keep doing it. You know, it's, it's, it, but it's tough. It's a discipline. It, it's, it is a discipline. And, and, it, and, and I would say the best thing to do if you are an artist and you're uh, uh, trying to create something of worth is deactivate your Twitter account. <laughs> Right, seeing as that's the most the closest we'll get to an upbeat ending. <laughs> Thank you very much to Graham Linnan. Thank you.